welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar about Brexit, knowing where you stand, understanding the UK-EU trade deal. I'd love to think that we would end up understanding it after an hour, but I fear that we've got a lot more to do before we really get to grips with this enormous uh, transaction. So, um, I'm Ros Kellaway. I'm the global co-chair of Evershed's EU competition and trade team with particular responsibility for the firm's work in relation to uh, Brexit. We've got a great panel today. I'm going to introduce the panel particularly as we go into the panel session. Um, I'm going to start with a, a, an overview and you can submit uh, questions and answers through the box at the bottom of the screen. We've already had over 60 questions submitted before the webinar, so our chance of getting through everybody's question, I'm afraid, is rather small, but we will put up the answers to uh, all the questions on the Brexit Hub and the session will be recorded, so you will be able to hear it again or send it to other people afterwards if you want to. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the panel today. We'll whiz through that, we'll come back to it, I'm sure. This is what I'm going to cover. Uh, basically an overview of the trade deal with particular emphasis on the regulatory level playing field because our feeling was that that was of enormous concern to businesses to really understand, having been in the single market and the customs union, which we've now left, what does it mean to be outside and trading under the trade agreement from the regulatory level playing field perspective? Then we're going to have a panel discussion and then I hope we'll have time for some Q&A. Next slide, please. So um, this was Boris Johnson's remark about the deal, which he was obviously quite pleased with. Um, unduly provocative to say that this is a cakeist treaty, but it's certainly from the, the patisserie department. And as we go through, I think we'll be able to make our own observations as to just how much cake the UK has achieved under this deal. Next slide, please. So those of you who've heard me speak before on Brexit will know from the last talk that I gave that there were three really awkward sticking points that it was reckoned that about 95% of the deal was agreed and that we only had about 5% to go. Uh, but the remaining 5% was particularly hard. And on fisheries, there was a compromise achieved to return 25% uh, of EU boats fishing rights in UK waters uh, with a, an, a review at the end of five and a half years uh, with a view to seeing if there couldn't be um, basically an annual quota agreed. And it was originally the starting point of the UK that it was the annual review of what the right quota was that they wanted, which is what Norway had. Um, I think it's fair to say that this was a compromise made in order to uh, get the deal done. Then on governance, um, the EU always wanted a single framework. Uh, the UK didn't, and then they put forward a number of separate frameworks. But in the end, I think there was a UK win in that there is no role for the Court of Justice of the European Union under this deal. And that was a very hard fought point. The, the Union uh, kept stuck by its institutions, particularly the Court of Justice, right to the end. But there is absolutely no mention of EU law in this trade agreement. However, there are, as we will see, some points that come out of the level, level playing field rules, which quite clearly reflect uh, EU law on state aid. The Court of Justice doesn't have a role. So what about the level playing field? And this was possibly the most vexed question of all, because uh, what the UK said was that on the level playing field, the EU wanted what the UK felt was an unprecedented level of alignment with EU regulatory frameworks, with EU rules on social law, environmental law, tax, competition and state aid as the reference point. And so going forward, the UK would be constrained in the laws that they could pass in these areas because they had to conform with EU regulatory law in, in relation to those things. So, furthermore, the EU wanted to exchange tariff-free access for regulatory alignment. So, no tariff-free access unless they could have that regulatory alignment. And I have to say, I do think that this is definitely, uh, from the UK perspective, a piece of cake that they have obtained because they won on that. 
Uh, and I think it's also important to uh, understand that although there is no no compulsion to comply with EU law going forward as a general principle, of course, the UK has taken in an enormous amount of EU law through the EU Withdrawal Act. As at 11pm or 11.1pm uh, GMT on the 31st of December 2020, all of current EU law, unless it has already been repealed or amended, has been retained at as UK law. So an enormous amount of that has come into the UK system. Uh, and it's important to note in that context, when we think about the subsidy rules, people may be saying, well, doesn't that mean that the whole of EU state aid law has come in uh, to UK law? But the answer to that is that that is one area of law which the government was very careful to amend um, before we finally uh, exited from the transition period. And um, basically all uh, state aid, EU state aid rules have been repealed in relation to the UK, not just regulations, but also uh, decisions. So it's a clean slate as far as state aid or anti-subsidy rules are concerned. Next slide, please. So what does the trade deal consist of? Well, the most important document is the TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. There are two supplementing agreements on nuclear cooperation and security procedures. Perhaps more of greater interest are the possibilities for joint declarations on future areas of cooperation. Um, you might think particularly financial services. I'm afraid there's only a few paragraphs on that. Speaking to my financial services colleagues who will be running a webinar once the declaration has actually been drawn up in March on what it says, they don't have exact, terribly high expectations of that, but there are a number of these to come. Is the deal in force now? Yes, it is, but on a... Um, uh, well, a provisional basis, if you like. Um, it's been ratified in the UK, um, but we're still waiting for ratification by the EU. And that will need to happen. There's a two-month period allowing for that to happen. How likely is it that it won't be ratified? My suggestion would be um, it's very likely to be ratified. It needs approval from the European Parliament. And then once the European Parliament has approved it, it needs approval from the Council of the EU consisting of the member states. And that requires unanimity. And again, I think it's very likely that we will see that because for the moment, the Council of the EU has said that it can, this deal can be applied on a provisional uh, basis. Next slide, please. So what does what did the UK do? Well, they passed the European Union Future Relationship Act 2020 in an incredible rush. The Parliament was entitled to have a meaningful vote on the deal. And that's what this act represented. It was either, I'm afraid, yes or no, no opportunity to amend it. And also, I, I would suggest inadequate opportunity to make sure that um, those parts of EU law which the government wished to repeal uh, and didn't need to leave in place in order to comply with the TCA or to amend to make them make sense once they, we'd entered into the TCA, there wasn't sufficient time to do that. And so section 29 to section 33, those are the sections of the Act that I would recommend that you have a really good look at because section 29 provides for existing domestic law to have effect with such modifications as are required for the purposes of implementing in that law the TCA or the Security of Classified Information Agreement. So it's a sort of modifying section um, which doesn't specify how domestic law should be modified, but clearly if there is litigation and that relates to how domestic law applies in the light of the obligations in the TCA, section 29 is saying domestic law must be modified. Um, the other point to note is EU law will no longer be applied in the, in, in the UK, save in relation maybe to those cases which are uh, on foot already and uh, started before the end of the transition period. Um, 
all kefir cases that relate to events that took place before the end uh, of the transition period. In future, UK courts are going to be applying principles of interpretation in relation to the TCA under public international law. So UK lawyers are going to be applying UK law and public international law in the context of this agreement. Ministers have got enormously wide powers to make regulation. They are really very wide indeed to give effect to the TCA without putting those in front of uh, Parliament necessarily. There are some limitations on those powers. So rules can't be retrospective. You can't create new criminal offences. I mean, the usual things. But basically, we're looking at Henry VIII's scope of powers here. Next slide, please. So on one slide, I give you here an overview of the TCA. It was quite hard to do that, but in the end, I felt it needed to be attempted because I haven't got very many more minutes in which to speak. And we want to hear from the panel. It's a key point. We've got 100% tariff liberal liberalisation and no quotas on uh, goods. Um, and James Lindop is going to say a, a quite a lot more about that. We've got provisions for cooperation on road transport and aviation because it's no good having tariff liber liberalisation if you can't move the goods around. Those uh, rules on cooperation are really about cross-border transport and aviation. So they wouldn't, for example, cover transport between Berlin and Paris. They will cover transport between Berlin and London and in relation to aviation the same. There's possibly more support for trade in services than people were expecting. So, for example, in relation to legal services, UK lawyers are allowed to apply UK law and international law right across uh, the EU. But there's nothing on mutual recognition of qualifications and to get admission to one of the bars of the member states in order to be able to apply EU law. That will depend on the rules of that member state. Uh, there is a bit on equivalence for financial services. There have been two determinations of equivalence so far uh, by the Commission. I, my colleagues tell me that it's not very likely that there will be more, but we will see this joint declaration and we need to wait and see what that says because we will see that by March. Something um, quite important, I think, on public procurement. As we know, the EU and the UK are both members of the WTO and the UK has signed up to the General Procurement Agreement. But the rules that are in or the, the provisions that are in the TCA go further. And in particular, they extend market access coverage to include things which are not included under the GPA. They include gas and heat distribution, private utilities, telecoms, education and more. And so actually... This is quite a, a big opportunity, I think, for access to markets uh, in relation to UK businesses and uh, e e EU bids. Uh, the UK will continue to take part in certain programmes, not all, not Erasmus, for example, but there are a number of others. As I said, and it's important to understand it, the TCA is subject to public international law and not EU law. There's a new governance structure set up under the TCA uh, with a, a partnership council consisting equally of the UK and EU representatives, and then the, the possibility to proceed to arbitration in certain instances, and that may uh, result in the suspension of the TCA. That would be obviously a, a very big step. And there are lots of things in the agreement that provide for consultation with experts to try and make sure that actually um, things are resolved amicably. And I think that's one of the hallmarks actually of the TCA. Uh, there are key provisions on the level playing field, which I'll come to in a minute. There's no data adequacy to zip decision, but there is a transition period, which my colleague Paula Barrett will say much more about. Next slide, please. So finally, my comments on the level playing field and subsidies. So the level playing field for uh, open and fair competition is stated in the TCA to be provided for in order to prevent distortion in trade and investment. And one can understand that we are 22 miles across the channel from the rest of the EU at the narrowest point. And one of the big issues was if they did allow uh, tariff-free access to uh, the EU market, would there be uh, a race to deregulate on the part of the UK, which would unfairly undercut other businesses in the EU? And so this is one of the key reasons, of course, why this has been such a difficult point to agree. So there are level playing field provisions, but this does not mean that there are provisions requiring the harmonization of standards. The 
uh, agreement doesn't approach the level playing field from that point of view. What it does is it talks about high standards in certain respects and also in relation to some aspects which were very important to the EU, non-regression, which means not going backwards. Remember that we've taken in all that EU law, a huge amount of EU law, which has become part of UK law with effect from uh, the 1st of January 2021. And in relation to certain things, we've agreed not to go backwards because there could be a real argument about whether you were going backwards, even if you maintained high standards. And I think that's quite an important difference to grasp. The non-regression obligation relates to environment, climate, labour and social rules. There's also a bit of non-regression in relation to tax and international um, rules laid down by the OECD, but to a much lesser extent. There's an obligation to maintain effective competition laws and good governance regarding tax too. And there is uh, an obligation on the UK to set up a new system of subsidy control with an independent body to oversee it. The EU clearly already has its state aid system in place and is obliged to keep it there. An interested party who's got standing under UK law must be able to challenge subsidies before domestic courts and that Going back to Section 29 of the UK Implementing Law, it's clear, I think, that Section 29 could be called into play as to how these anti-subsidy principles in the TCA should apply to a particular case. The TCA defines us what a subsidy is and lists common principles, many of which we would recognise from the state aid regime. But in the UK, you won't have EU state aid law to pray in aid in relation to what they, they should mean going forward, because the UK government said they wanted a pretty clean sheet, in fact. And there's no requirement to have an ex ante control mechanism, which is what the EU has now. Uh, You can pay out the subsidies and control them afterwards. Next slide, please. And then lastly, dispute settlement. How does that work? Well, with the level playing field, the disputes are taken out of the major sort of overriding disputes resolution provisions from the TCA. And there are special provisions for dispute resolution on, on level playing field. And disputes are designed to be resolved through consultation because really ideally we want settlements of problems, a recourse to a panel of experts, and then ultimately potentially temporary remedies including rebalancing countermeasures if there are material impacts on trade or investment. But those must be proportionate and uh, they must be necessary in order to um, redress the harm that's been caused by um, the by by the uh, infringement of the level playing field uh, rules. There's a specific dispute settlement set of provisions for subsidies. And just note that there isn't any arbitration between the EU and the UK on specific subsidies which have been granted. The intention very clearly is that subsidies should be regulated domestically. So that's what I Uh, wanted to cover. I know it's a a bit of a cook's tour, but we will be doing future webinars on a number of aspects of what I've said. And I think I'd like to turn now to the panel discussion. And I'm going to start by asking my uh, colleague, Audrey Elliott, who is a partner in our firm and the head of the firm's global mobility and business immigration team, some questions. So, uh, Audrey, Um, I'd like to ask you, please, my first question is, the rights of citizens post-Brexit were covered very comprehensively in the withdrawal agreement, which has already, of course, been concluded. Does the trade agreement change or add to any of the terms that were in the withdrawal agreement? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ros, and good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that we didn't know about the challenges that leaving Europe and the loss of the flexibility and fluidity that free movement gave to us from a people perspective. We've known about that some, for some time, and, and in simple terms, it obviously means we've got hard borders, um, where in, in the past we haven't. And we've had behaviours in place and, and a, a process for thinking about how we deal with these borders for some time, obviously, in relation to non EU nationals Um, and and leaving EU obviously requires us to think more carefully about immigration for EU nationals as well. 
So what the withdrawal agreement did was provide protection for those that were either resident in the UK or for UK nationals resident in, in Europe before the end of the transition period, so the end of last year, or importantly, those that had a pattern of travel, um, of working in particular, in another member state again before the end of last year. Um, so the withdrawal agreement effectively separates European nationals and UK nationals into two categories, those that kind of got the foot in the door before the end of last year uh, and those that haven't yet started um, that pattern of behaviour. Um, so for individuals that are not covered by the um, withdrawal agreement and don't have that protection, um, we're looking at basically three questions. And um, first of all, do they need a visa to do the activities they want to do either in the UK or in Europe? Um, and for that, we're looking at assessment of, of the business visit activities, because there is a, quite a lot of activities uh, that are work related that you can do in the UK or in Europe without getting a work visa. And obviously, that's that's the easiest route to follow. If the individual is doing activities outside of that, um, that remit, the permitted activities as a visitor, then we're looking at is there a visa route that's open to them? And I say, is there a visa route? Because sometimes there isn't a visa route that is appropriate for a particular role um, because there are quite often qualification requirements or salary requirements. So I'm always keen to say there isn't always a let's get a visa, it's is there a visa? And even if there is a visa route, um, the third question, and it's an important one, is, is it palatable? Um, immigration and visa applications come with time, cost, admin, um, and employers need to think about whether or not that's a, an activity they want to get involved in. So that was all done in the withdrawal agreement. The trade agreement did bring us two um, limited but, but welcome changes. Um, the first was to expand that definition of business visit. Not much, and we've now got market research within the definition of the type of work that's been carried out without a visa. And the third change relates, sorry, the second change relates to an expansion of the international agreement worker, which is a temporary visa to come to the UK. And um, this now covers contractual services suppliers and independent professionals. Um, so where a British company, a UK company is contracting with a European company for the supply of services that requires contractors to come to the UK, this new route, or the expansion of this tier five route may be an option. Um, I would say with, it, with a word of caution though, because it is quite a complex route and comes with a lot of criteria around the type of services that are being provided and also the qualifications etc of the individual contractor so it's there it was given to us by the trade agreement but is not a total panacea for this type of activity okay thank you very much audrey um so could i ask a practical uh, question which mm. reflects the question that a client, i think a client sent in what's the situation for a company with a head office in paris with french employees but with teams in the uk what should they be mm. thinking about mm -hmm. So, first of all, and, and with all these scenarios and with any international travel now between the UK and Europe, it's thinking about immigration. It has to be front of mind. We need to, to stop thinking about we just get on the train or get on the plane and we don't need to think about visas. So the first thing I'd be doing is auditing, um, looking at my team in Paris. Have they got that pattern of travel or how, did they ha even have a residence in the UK before the end of last year? If so, they have withdrawal agreement protection. Let's get them safe with the evidence of that status. Um, those are really quick wins. For new travellers, I'm going to be looking at um, my three questions. Do they need a visa? And, and in the scenario you describe where we've got a French national coming into the UK to manage their team in the UK, I would say that is definitely activity that would require some sort of work visa. So the head office will be looking at um, either a skilled worker visa under the new route that the UK has built for um, EU nationals coming to the UK, or whether or not there's an intercompany transfer visa that could be obtained. And then thinking about the, the timing and the cost of that and being planned for the next trip. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so uh, what are your top tips in terms of planning? So I think, doing? yeah, I'd be thinking about creating the awareness of the fact that there, um, there are now these immigration considerations to be thought about, um, generating some internal champions. Um, on a more practical level, I'd probably be thinking about giving those EU-wide jobs to EU nationals, not particularly palatable for, for, for UK workforce, but it's going to be infinitely easier for pan-European roles to be carried out by EU nationals 
or by UK nationals who are resident in Europe because the treaty still gives them rights as third country nationals. Okay. Um, and then thinking, and then, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, the final one, just thinking about in the jurisdictions where you carry out activities, looking at what the immigration regimes are and thinking about doing the registration process that may be necessary to support a visa. OK, that's helpful. And if you're a UK, what about a UK business who relies on specialist contracts from the from from the EU? What, what's what's their position? Yeah, so again, thinking about immigration, just because we've got a contract with a European country doesn't mean that the um, contractors can come into the UK without thinking about visas. They may also have withdrawal agreement protection if they've been doing that work before the end of last year. But apart from that, we're probably looking at that international agreement worker that I mentioned um, at the outset. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm going to turn now to Paula Barrett, uh, co-chair Global Co-Chair of Data Privacy and Data Security. Paula, you're in the hot seat here. There was a lot of focus on an adequacy decision. And, you know, I've heard people say, oh, we've got it now because, you know, that's what the TCA says. Mm. Actually, can you tell us what deal was reached on data transfers? Yeah, not quite an adequacy decision. Um, so what we've ended up with is a grace period, really. Um, the process for um, evaluating whether the UK meets the standards of adequacy um, is still underway. And what they've done is given the European Commission um, and indeed the rest of us a bit of a breathing space to allow that process to conclude. Um, so for the next four months, um, there is a grace period it automatically renews for a further two. There's a quid pro quo in here, which is that in essence, the UK regime is in a bit of a standstill during that time. Um, no changes to our regime as it was at the 31st of um, December that had some knock on effects um, potentially in relation to the granting of new binding corporate rules, etc. Um, but I think in reality, any changes, if the government is so minded to do so, will be something they'll be thinking about for longer than a, a few months. So um, there's going to be some, some leeway as to whether we'll get an adequacy decision. I think that is still all to be played for. It is not a given. Um, there's some complications because of the decision in the Schrems case in particular and other cases at the back end of last year that mean that transfers um, relying on things like standard corporate rules and um, are more complicated, but also actually the way in which adequacy is looked at um, would appear to be that much stricter. So there's, there's a good reason why it is taking a, some, a longer period of time. I don't think we can say it is a given that we will get an adequacy decision. Mm. Um, so that does mean, as we'll maybe come on to, that actually um, there are some sensible steps that businesses ought to be taking to put themselves in a good position if we do not get an adequacy decision. OK, uh, well, I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. Okay. Uh, my next question is, are there other key points on data protection or data sharing in the agreement apart from adequacy? Yes, um, there are. There's quite a lot of, of references to data, um, personal data, um, you know, open data, so freedom of information type um, data, uh, cyber security provisions. So there's quite a lot in there. Um, for the purposes of today, I'm going to focus on a couple of things um, that are more broadly relevant. Um, the first being that in the context of a standard level playing field, there are um, statements in there about direct marketing um, and the context in particular of digital services. Um, these are really a reiteration of what we have already. Um, so in essence saying that um, if you're gonna send direct marketing um, by email, by SMS, that that is going to be um, still a consent-based regime, albeit that if you're an existing customer, then an opt-out could be relied upon. Now, that's pretty much what we have now. Um, so it's, it's a, a status quo uh, position really. Um, and then the other reference is a re in relation to data localization. Uh, and that, uh, again, is about level playing fields that, um, in essence, neither, uh, no, no party will introduce um, requirements that create data, data localization, i.e. you have to keep your server or your, your, your data in a particular location. And, and that's the theme we're seeing, obviously, across the world at the moment, um, which does have some strong competition implications. 
So those are the two things I'd call out. Other provisions, as I say, relate which are more maybe sectoral specific. So things, for example, about the exchange of passenger information, the sharing for cybersecurity protection, the sharing for law enforcement purposes. So there is more in there, but that tends to be a, it's more of a state-based um, sharing um, that's contemplated in, in those provisions. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And what should businesses be doing now? So they should be looking at um, preparations um, on a number of levels. The, the main point to, re- to realise is, as Audra was referring to in relation to employment, so that on the data side of things, much of the position is already, was already addressed within, within the context of the withdrawal agreement. So we know we here we are now in January. We now are outside of the of the GDPR per se. What we have is the UK GDPR. Um, we also have the Data Protection Act 2018. We have, in essence, GDPR as absorbed into UK law as it was in the uh, at the 31st of December. Um, so, in essence, they should be cracking on with it, with what was already known to us pre, prior to the end of December, i.e. have you appointed EU representatives, have you appointed UK representatives where those are needed, have you updated all of your documentation so you've got the right legal references, um, and perhaps also dealing with transfers as well. Um, have you updated your breach response to, to contemplate you're going to have maybe um, ICO to notify, not just an EU lead authority. So, those things to be getting on with, and then importantly, I'd reiterate, to deal with transfers. Um, I strongly discourage people to actually leave it as a bet as to whether or not when or not we're going to have adequacy. Far better you invest the time, and I'm afraid yes, effort, to have something in place um, rather than bet on it being an adequacy decision um, at this point. Okay, that, that's really, really helpful. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to turn to you, James Lindop, who is our head of trade. And um, I'm going to start, James, by asking you, what are the four must-know points that businesses should be aware of in respect of trade? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I think I think the top of the list has to be in relation to tariffs and quotas. Um, and we'll all be well aware that this is one of the things that businesses were, were really waiting to hear as to what would happen in terms of the agreement. And as Ros mentioned at the start of the presentation, we've uh, now got a situation where uh, provided, and this is a really important, provided rules of origin are satisfied, the movement of goods between the UK and the EU will be tariff and quota free. And this is a win for the UK government. They've made a you know, strong point of that in, in, in all of their guidance. This is the first time the EU has agreed to zero tariffs, zero quota deal right from the outset. Normally, it's just a ratcheted mechanism um, up to a high level of goods, but not necessarily all goods. So I think that's the first point. However, um, there is, of course, in any free trade agreement, always the possibility of uh, tariffs to be imposed by either party in certain situations. Um, so there could be tariffs imposed through anti-dumping measures, anti-subsidy measures, or other safeguard measures in line with WTO requirements. So just to be aware of, uh, of those. And importantly, another point I just wanted to make in relation to tariffs is that, um, as Ros mentioned at the outset, the concept of a level playing field was a very contentious point during the negotiations. Um, and, and actually, both parties have the right to determine their own laws subject to the broad constraints of the agreement, which is a you know, pretty vague parameter. But as a result, um, where there are divergencies which, which impact on trade or investment, there's this rebalancing mechanism which allows either party to impose certain measure or countermeasures where they think their interests are being harmed in some way. So where a party feels it's being injured, then it can implement unilateral temporary but proportionate countermeasures to, to, to counter that and try and rebalance uh, the playing field. So that's one element. The other element and is a broader point on this rebalancing mechanism is that if these measures are implemented frequently, then either side can trigger a review of the relevant provisions and trade aspects of the TCA to ensure that an appropriate balance is restored um, by amendment of the TCA. And this is really quite an unusual provision. So that's in relation to tariffs and quotas. I think the second point is definitely on origin. And there have been a lot of questions in relation to origin. It is an area, a complex area, and and businesses do find it uh, difficult to comply with, um, particularly where they're not used to third country trade. And um, if we just move on to the diagram, 
Amy, I've tried to put this in a simplified format, and it is very simplistic for the purposes of this, this webinar, but hopefully um, will allow you just a visual representation of, of some of the ways in which origin can be satisfied. Um, so as I referred to, we're talking about uh, free trade, so trade of, of goods without any tariffs, but only where origin status uh, has been satisfied. Can, can goods qualify from this preferential zero uh, rate treatment? And there are a number of ways in which you can satisfy origin. So the first one is in relation to whether the goods are wholly obtained. So what we're talking about there is whether the product in question has been extracted from the sea or is being grown um, on the land of either party. The second way in which you can satisfy origin is um, if they are produced, uh, the product is produced exclusively from materials that are wholly obtained. Um, in, in one of the parties, or the third way, and the, this is the third way in relation to the TCA, I should say, these are the three, three methods of origin satisfaction under the TCA. Um, if they incorporate non-originated materials meeting certain product specific requirements, and these are each set out in the annex to the TCA, uh, these product specific requirements themselves comprise of, of three elements uh, in relation to the TCA. So the first is that the, 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 the product in question has to change its tariff classification, which means that the final goods cannot have the same tariff, tariff classification as any of the non-originating material used to make them. So there has to be a change in, in classification code. The second thing is that there's a specific process has taken place in order to get to a, a originating status. So uh, there's a chemical or, or biotechnological process that's taken place and the final one is, is the value added rule, which effectively sets a limit on the value of non-originating materials um, uh, above which the final product cannot be considered to be um, originating. And this is typically set at a percentage of the X works value of the final product. Um, and I'm just going to use this as a point to pick up a, a question that's actually ra raised already, um, which is in relation to the specific rule of origin for, for motor cars and motor vehicles, because this is the relevant one. So the TCA says that at least 55% of the materials making up a car must originate in either the UK or, or EU. So only gives a 45% non-originating threshold, um, which is, you know, that's, that's quite high, uh, sorry, quite low for in, t in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the actual percentages. Um, now, but what happens if you don't satisfy one of these rules? Well, there are, are a number of ways in which, or two ways, in fact, in which you can um, still get over the threshold. The, the agreement provides for something called bilateral accumulation, which effectively means that um, EU materials and processes used in uh, UK production and UK materials used in EU production can count towards the originating calculations. So just to put that into an, in an example, if the relevant rule of origin states uh, the minimum, uh, there's a minimum of 40% domestic value added and the UK contribution is let's say 30% and the EU imports contribute 30%, then bilateral accumulation means the EU's input can be included in the calculation of domestic content. So uh, giving 60% and therefore being able to satisfy the origin requirement. So that's very helpful and is, is there to facilitate trade between the EU and the UK. But what it doesn't do is allow um, materials originating in any other third countries to count towards uh, the originating calculations as they would in diagonal or full communicate, uh, accumulation. So and I think this is what the government was really aiming for. Um, but this means that, that effectively under bilateral, any um, uh, material sourced in, in a third country, irrespective of whether the EU or the UK independently has a free trade agreement, that cannot count towards the origin calculations. This is something that business will import um, uh, products and, 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 and incorporate them into, into final products when they really need to consider and look at in the future. Um, one other thing just on origin uh, uh, is that to ease the administrative burden of, of this, because it's recognised that it does 
uh, it, it is difficult sometimes to comply with it, that exporters will also be able to self-certify the, the origin of, uh, of their goods. And um, the final point, just on another way in which was in the diagram, which you can satisfy origin is through the tolerance rule. So um, where you still don't meet the requirements for origin through accumulation, there are general tolerance thresholds provided um, which, which effectively allow non-originating non material um, to, to, if it provided it doesn't exceed a specific percentage of the weight or value of the final product, um, then it can claim origin. Now in the TCA, uh, this provides for, for 10 to 15% tolerance. Um, US FDA is often a 7%, but that is also a way in which you can, you can satisfy origin. Mm, goodness me. Uh, and then the final thing, just very briefly, uh, the third thing is on customs. Clearly, it was always going to be the case that customs controls and formalities were going to be the going to be the, something we had to comply with. That hasn't changed. Um, it will still need to comply with all of those. The, the one point to make is that um, a key component of the TCA is mutual recognition of trusted trader and authorized economic operator status. And businesses that have got that, as we've said, we've always said uh, in relation to preparing for, for, for our exit from the EU, is that they will benefit from um, uh, you know, customs uh, uh, mo moving goods through customs um, and the customs process and operators will be simplified for those uh, operators who've got that. And then the fourth and final thing in relation to technical barriers um, is that there will effectively be two separate regulatory and legal spheres between the EU and the UK. We can't, can't get away from that. But the parties have agreed that their um, domestic product standards and technical regulations will be based on the same international standard setting bodies to allow and facilitate uh, trade between the two. So I think those are the four, four key things. Mm, goodness me, there's an enormous amount in that, huge amount to digest for people. Um, thank you for that. So I think my next question is, what about Northern Ireland? Um, what's the impact of the, um, of the FCA on trade with, with Northern Ireland, if any? Yeah, well, the answer is uh, not a huge amount um, because trade with Northern Ireland will remain governed by the Northern Irish Protocol and the TCA really doesn't uh, doesn't affect that. So, um, as I'm sure everyone is aware, Northern Ireland remains part of the UK's customs territory, but will continue to apply the um, Union Customs Code, VAT rules and, uh, and other uh, single market rules. Um, but goods entering Northern Ireland from GB will be subject to new customs rules um, and, and in particular uh, import declarations and will need to comply with um, uh, regulatory requirements. So that hasn't changed. I think probably the one thing that we can say has changed is, is obviously in respect to, to tariffs, um, because as a general principle, um, EU tariffs apply for imports into Northern Ireland where they are at risk of moving um, into the EU. But the relevant provisions of the Joint Committee's decision on goods not at risk provides that goods which have a, a duty equal to zero are automatically not at risk. So the good news here is that because the EU and UK have agreed um, uh, no tariffs will apply to their goods, that anything moving between GB and Northern Ireland is automatically seen to be as not at risk. So hopefully that in some ways reduces the friction, notwithstanding the fact that there are clearly additional customs formalities that will have to be complied with. That's great. Thank you for explaining that. And then I suppose lastly, um, perhaps just in, in a minute or so, does the um, FCA change the Brexit preparation trade related advice and information that we've been giving for some time now during our, our Brexit webinars? Yeah, no, the short answer is no. Um, the planning done previously largely is, is still relevant. The, the crux of the advice we were giving prior to um, uh, the end of the transition period um, was predominantly in relation to, to two areas where we can leave tariffs aside for now. That was the third possibly, but um, yeah, the first was do products or activities to comply with uh, regulatory requirements. So, um, uh, ha have um, uh, do do they do, do those goods still meet the relevant party standards? Um, 
you know, but the, there are mechanisms now to ensure that the parties are able to uh, that, that facilitate movement, so self-declaration of conformity um, and, and sector-specific mechanisms. And the UK has gone further um, in, in allowing transition periods for compliance with UK standards for EU goods coming over. So in relation to changes to UK CA marking from C, uh, EU CE marking and, and that sort of thing. Um, and the other the other point was in relation to um, whether businesses have the necessary actors in order to legally and practically fulfil customs formalities. So uh, do you have, you know, for the purpose of importing, do you have an EU business or um, an EU established customs agent allowing you to import into the EU and, and same for, for the UK? This is all still relevant. Um, so really nothing has changed on, on that front. I think the one thing that does help is the government is obviously allowing a transition period in relation to certain aspects of customs as well. So there's a temporary mm. relief uh, so far as making declarations and paying duties is concerned. Um, and, and so, yeah, there are other ways in which uh, the, the, the EU and the UK are helping to facilitate this this transition into the into the new order, if you like. So I think the, the, the short answer really is no, nothing's changed. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so I'm going to turn to uh, Rob, Mc, Rob McNabb now, who's a partner in our construction practice specialising in energy infrastructure projects, to ask you, Rob, a few questions about what's uh, in the FCA about energy, what are the principles that have been agreed between the EU and the UK um, in the energy sector? For us, I think the, the first part to answering that question is to understand what no longer applies. Um, and as of the 1st of January, a lot of the regulatory framework that dealt with um, energy um, has, has, has been removed from the UK. So the UK is no longer part of the EU's internal energy market, although Northern Ireland does remain within that uh, system. So that's the market that essentially um, helps ensure security of supply of gas, electricity and oil via interconnectors between the EU and, and the UK. Um, the, the UK has left the joint uh, action against climate change. It's left, left the EU's emission trading scheme and it's left the uh, European atomic energy community. So a lot of the regulation has, has fallen away. Uh, and that's been replaced by uh, a framework for future cooperation in relation to energy. Uh, and so the trade agreement really, it sets out three kind of fairly clear objectives in terms of uh, how we want to move forward in relation to energy. Those objectives being, first of all, to facilitate trade and investment, both of energy itself, but also in relation to uh, the raw materials used to generate energy. So oil and gas being the most uh, obvious example. Uh, it's intended to ensure security of supply, and uh, and this uh, point features quite heavily to uh, continue the fight against climate change. Mm. Uh, so those uh, objectives are dealt with either by way of certain agreed principles, which are set out in the agreement, or by an intent to enter into new agreements uh, in the future. So the UK can now pursue its own policy objectives when it comes to energy. It can secure its own uh, supplies of energy. Uh, it can set its own targets uh, in terms of fighting climate change, subject to certain principles that are set out in the agreement. And briefly, those are that there will be reciprocal, non-discriminatory access to each uh, other's uh, energy transport infrastructure. Likewise, in terms of access to each other's markets, but on that point, I think it's it's important to note that doesn't mean that the UK or the EU can't uh, set their own subsidies. Subsidies can be set, but they just need to have equal access for both the EU and the UK uh, market participants. So, for example, uh, the UK's current uh, contract for difference um, regime can can continue and is is unaffected by the uh, by the trade agreement. Uh, there is a prohibition now on export restrictions and uh, dual pricing. And in relation to climate change, whilst that will now be completely within the uh, UK's gift in terms of its targets and how it goes about achieving them, there are uh, there is a, a restatement by both sides uh, in relation to climate change. So that the 2015 Paris Agreement has been uh, restated and that will continue. Uh, and there's also a, re a reciprocal commitment uh, on both sides to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, and then finally, um, 
the, the, the element that hasn't been replaced is there will no longer uh, be a mechanism for emissions trading. Uh, but there is an agreement for both sides to use serious consideration um, uh, in order to achieve alignment of carbon pricing systems. So there's some work to be done to see whether that will uh, now be set in stone. Okay, thank you. Um, so what about wholesale market abuse and the EU regulation that, that guards against that? Will that be enforced now? Uh, we've come to the end of the transition period. Uh, not in the UK, no. So, so remit, which is is the uh, EU-wide um, regulation that, that, that protects against um, wholesale market abuse, um, won't apply in the UK, and those powers will now devolve to Ofgem. I think the system, however, that will be utilised will be broadly the same, so the requirement to register and to report on uh, dealings and transactions will, will remain. It's just administered now through Ofgem as opposed to remit. There is a difference, however, in terms of the treatment of EU um, entities as opposed to UK entities in terms of registration. So if a uh, market participant is currently registered with Ofdem or is currently registered with an EU member state, they will still be able to continue to uh, trade within the UK. In reverse, however, if a UK entity is registered with Ofgem and they want to trade within the EU, they will now need to re-register re with an EU member state country in order to do so. Okay. Um, and what about interconnectors? Because we rely on um, access to the single energy or yeah, the EU energy market through interconnectors, as I understand it. What's going to happen to cross-border trading across interconnectors? Yeah, good question. Um, we get 10% of our power via those sources. So obviously very important in terms of keeping the lights on and so on. Um, the key message is that there's not anticipated to be any interruption of flows between the UK and the EU in either direction, uh, which actually is of particular importance for, for Ireland because they are now separated in infrastructure uh, terms from the EU in terms of interconnectors. Uh, and so that this is quite an important issue for, um, for the Republic of Ireland. Uh, so what the trade agreement does is it provides for the parties to take steps to put a new agreement in place to regulate all of this. So we don't have that detail um, at the moment. Um, the, the main principle, however, is, is set out, and that is a principle of equivalence on, in, on, in both directions. Uh, what the agreement does do, however, is it sets an interim arrangement, which is a cost use space mechanism for um, for the utilization of utility, uh, sorry, of interconnectors in, in, in both directions. So I think, as I said, th there's no anticipation at the moment that there will be any interruptions of flows or, or, or pricing changes as a result of this. Um, but there is some work to, to be done in order to set the long-term relationship. Okay, that's, that's great. Thank you very much, Rob. And then lastly, I'm going to turn to my partner, Dan Roskis who uh, is the partner in charge of competition, EU and trade in uh, Paris. And I'm going to ask you, Dan, to draw a few comparisons just in a few minutes between the new, what looks as it will be, the new UK re regime for subsidies based on what we know from the, um, the TCA and the existing EU state aid regime. What are your thoughts on that? It's pleasure, Rose. Uh... Well, as you said, and I will not come back at length on that, there are lots of common principles uh, between the EU state aids and the UK subsidies. Of course, these are different terms, but uh, we understand for obvious reasons why the TCA was providing for a specific term for subsidy. So similar principles similar list of prohibited subsidies or state aids, typically unlimited state guarantees or uh, export subsidies with a few exceptions on, uh, uh, on export credit insurance, typically. On the differences, the first one we can see is the difference in the definition of subsidies and state aids. And there is a, a missing condition for the definition of subsidy, which has uh, the impact on competition. A state aid is qualified as a state aid under EU law if it has a potential or actual effect on competition. Subsidies, in the definition, you cannot find 
that requirement, uh, meaning that uh, if you go to court uh, or defend or challenge a UK subsidy, you do not have to show that it has an impact on competition. Rather, uh, the TCA provides that subsidies to qualify as UK subsidies in the meaning of the TCA should have a potential or actual effect on investment and or trade between the EU and the UK. Uh, uh, and that's the main difference. That being said, a UK subsidy uh, is still uh, a specific measure uh, benefiting to one company or a group of companies or end another condition, it has to grant an economic advantage. So you see that there is a clear difference, but we still have uh, some other conditions. That's on the definition. So in a way, it may make uh, uh, the work of lawyers be before courts uh, a little bit easier or not. I'll come back on that. Second difference, the scope. Uh, typically, uh, subsidies to the audiovisual sector are out of the new regime under the TCA. And we know uh, as uh, EU lawyers that a lot of the case law of the EU Court of Justice deals with uh, 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 state aids to the public audiovisual sector. And it has set some general conditions, rules, interpretation, applying to other uh, to other uh, 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 type of state aids, uh, 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 f generally speaking, for public services. So that's a difference. Third difference, uh, uh, the de minimis threshold is not the same. Uh, under EU law, it's 200 euro uh, per company for three years. Uh, so if you're below that, no problem under EU law. Uh, the de minimis threshold for subsidies is almost the double, uh, uh, the equivalent of 380,000 uh, euros, uh, so below which a UK subsidy can be granted to one company for three years again. But the main difference is that UK subsidies are not subject to a pre-authorization regime. So practically speaking, and very quickly being conscious of time. Under EU law, just as a reminder, a state aid cannot be granted until and unless it benefits from a, an individual decision of the EU Commission, or unless it benefits from a general block exemptions, a block exemption. Here, with the UK subsidy, no block exemption regime for the moment, at the very least. And uh, it means that the UK government can decide to implement and to pay for a subsidy without waiting for any decision. Mm -hmm. And then, if a competitor, even a, a, another UK company, I'm not even speaking about EU companies wanting to, to challenge the UK subsidy paid to UK company, then the UK company or the EU company will have to go to court. And it's only after a world procedure that uh, uh, maybe the court may decide to order the reimbursement of the subsidy or to validate it. Uh, UK courts also have the power to suspend. So it's a, it's a very important difference. And as I wanted to be practical, it brings some legal uncertainty. Uh, and not only for EU companies willing to challenge or even UK companies, but for the beneficiary of the measure, because if uh, uh, within a short time period, the, the subsidy is challenged before a court, you will have to wait until the end of the procedure to be fully safe that you will not have to reimburse and eventually pay damages. So that's about the, the main uh, uh, differences. Uh, okay, well, that, that's great. Thank you very much for bringing that out. And I know we are coming up to the hour. I'm going to uh, keep going. I've got 
one more point that I want to ask Dan, and then I'm going to turn to a few of the questions. So do stay with us if you if you would like to hear those. We won't be able to answer them all. In addition to the 60 that arrived before the web webinar, we have another 42 which have come in. So we're going to be kept busy uh, drafting answers to those, and we will post them on, on the Hub. Don't worry, they will be there. So my last question to you, Dan, is a much higher level question, uh, really, as we discuss, and that's on your perspective, based as you are, still in the EU. What do you feel about the future implementation of the UK EU TCA? What, what's your feeling generally about the nature of the agreement that's been struck? Well, uh, it's clearly a compromise. And uh, my feeling uh, actually that each party wanted to reach the agreement, okay, uh, in spite of declaration in the press or, or threatens about the no deal. Uh, so it's a compromise. We needed to have a deal and not only because of the impact on the UK economy, but also to on EU companies. And I'm thinking uh, about sectors like aeronautical uh, sector, automotive sector, but also food and pharmaceuticals. So clearly it's a compromise. You can read it. I mean, terms are quite balanced. We have common concepts, etc. That being said, you've asked me about the future. I do not have any crystal ball, okay? Uh, but what I can say very generally, and I will echo uh, what Paula said in a way, uh, is that it will be all about the enforcement of that TCA. Uh, for data protection, it's about the adequacy decision. We should have a clear view. But you you, you said, Rose, that the, in intro, uh, as an introduction, that UK courts will have a, a crucial role uh, mm -hmm. because there is a clean sheet now. It's a, an entire uh, case law to be built in the UK because EU case law will no longer apply, whatever the area concerned is. So... Uh, well, difficult to say whether it's a time ticking bomb or an already paved, paved road. Uh, really, uh, I would like to be optimistic uh, and, and, and to be trustful in the uh, wiseness of UK courts. I will not even mention the, the, the dispute settlement uh, uh, process which has been uh, decided between EU and the UK, uh, as far as our clients are concerned, I would not be so trustful uh, on the implementation of that. Okay, well, thank you for that, because I, I, I share your views, and I, I actually think there's more cake in this deal than I personally was expecting, uh, and it remains to be seen, you know, whether it turns out like that. I'll continue for uh, another three or four minutes with a number of the uh, questions that we've received, and Audrey, if I may come back to you um, with a question which was about what UK labour law uh, issue might be most likely to change first, because of course there is this possibility for uh, you know not so much alignment in the future, yeah. sub subject to non-regression. Yes, so um, I don't think we're expecting any significant or immediate changes in um, UK um, employment law protection, particularly given the government's commitment to protecting employee rights as seen in the 2019 manifesto. We saw a commitment to um, increase rights for casual workers and, and working parents. I think we're more likely to see um, a creeping change, maybe through minor tweaks to legislation. Um, there are some aspects of the transfer of undertaking regulations GP, you know, particularly in relation to harmonisations of T's and C's post-transfer um, that have caused a lot of angst um, and subject to the non-regression principle. We might see some, some of that sort of tweak um, recently. Well, in the last few years, we've seen quite a lot of case law around um, holiday pay under the working time regulations, the directive. And that might be the sort of thing that's caused real problems for employers rather than seeking to reduce rights. And, and of course, a, a change as we see case law diverge over time. OK, thank you for that. Um, Paula? I'm just going to come back to you. I'm going to draw it to a close in a minute or two. But I think data adequacy is 
a huge focus for the clients' questions, both before and during the, the, the webinar. Can I just ask you, do, do you really think it's realistic that there'll be an adequacy decision for the UK within the next six months? Um, let me get to my crystal ball, um, because I think it is quite, it, it's looking a bit foggy, if I'm honest. I think um, it is something where um, I think it's going to be a close call. I'm, I'm not betting on it. There's a lot of, um, and I think that's the fundamental point, I'm not betting on it. There's, I personally think we should get an adequacy decision, um, but I think there there are certainly a lot of factors to be considered. and. There's also a timing point here. These things typically take years to, to be declared. So this is re this is very much a fast track um, adequacy decision if it's going to be granted. So I wouldn't bet on it in the first in the coming six months. Okay. Well, th thank you very much for that. So we we're a fairly way past the hour now. Um, and we've still got 850 people on the line. Uh, I can continue with questions if people are happy to stay on. So I'll, go, I'll actually tackle one or two more. Um, James, we've got a very hard question here about the custom status of uh, certain types of goods previously UK origin and imported um, and VAT paid that was situated in the EU on the 31st of December 2020. It's a sort of transitional style question. Um, what's, what is the custom status of, the, of those goods? Yeah, and it is a good question. Um, it, it, so the answer to it will depend on um, the, the specific EU legislation under which they were, or which is relevant to the product in question, and whether or not those goods have have been placed on the market. Now, whether that's the EU market or the UK market doesn't matter. But if you satisfy that requirement of them having been placed on the market, then they can circulate freely, between, you know, in the EU or, or the UK. Now, often, um, just to give you one example, and it is legislation specific in relation to some goods, you're able to say they've been placed on the market where there is um, a, a, an offer or an agreement between the parties and the stage of manufacture for the product has been completed and then you are able to satisfy that requirement. So provided you're able to do that and just, as I say, depending on the specific legislation, then there's no reason why they cannot move freely still, uh, even though we've left. Mm. OK, well, I think we're going to need a lot of trade and customs and rules of origin advice following this this TCA. OK, well, at, at that point, as we're coming up to 10 past the hour, I feel I've held you all long enough. But we will thank you very much for joining us. We've had a phenomenal number of people attend this webinar and stay with us right the way through. Thank you for that. And of course, there will be a recording of it. Please refer to the Brexit Hub. We've got quite a lot of uh, future events coming up on this subject and we hope that you will join us for those and also of course to see the answer to the 100 plus questions that we've received so uh, on that note i wish you all a good afternoon thank you very much for for, for joining in